Deuteronomy 32. Now let's stand to honor to the reading of God's word. By the way, when I tell you to do that, if someone is physically impaired, I don't expect you to stand. Uh, but those of you who are young and healthy like me, uh, I would think it would be a good thing to do that. Okay? Uh, Deuteronomy 32. Actually, we're going to go back to chapter 31, verse 30. There should not be a chapter division there. It says, Then Moses uh, spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. As rain drops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish. A perverse and crooked generation. Now that last verse, I think, particularly refers to those times of rebellion when Israel did not follow by faith. Verse 6. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought, who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember. That's an ex, that, that is an extremely significant word. Because remember now, Moses is coming to the end of his time as leader of the children of Israel. And he is looking back over the 40 years that he has led these people. And he says to them, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Remember that because of their unbelief, God called Israel, caused Israel to wander about in the wilderness to kill off, literally to kill off, two generations of unbelievers and to rise up new generations who would follow him by faith. Remember this highly significant verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of their peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's pay, pay, portion, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found them in a desert land and in a wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord led him, and there was no foreign God with him. Bless Lord, I pray the reading of your word. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May our hearts be open, Father, today to the Spirit, to receive the encouragement and the challenge from your word. That we might be salt and light to a world that is, that is more increasingly fall, falling into darkness. Lord, help us to be your children. And help us, Father, to stand for you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. thank you. You may be seated. As the eagle, so the Lord. Maybe I ought to turn this thing on. There we go. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19 says, There are three things that amaze me. No four things that I don't understand. Look at the first one in verse 19. How the eagle glides through the sky. If you've ever seen an eagle fly, you understand what he is talking about. To be quite frank with you, uh, there is, uh, it is not an accident that the eagle is known as the king of birds. He is unparalleled in his grace and swiftness. And he finds himself most at home soaring to heights that other birds can only imagine. He glides almost effortlessly, effortlessly on the winds and through space. It is a fierce predator and its speed and keen eye, uh, with its keen, speed and keen eye, but it will never kill without reason. 
It only hunts to appease its hunger. Man is the only one of God's creatures I know that consistently will kill for sport. Now, with the idea of its keen eye, it was an amazing thing that I had, that I had learned as I was studying for this sermon, uh, that the eagle can see at a distance of three miles. It can see its prey three miles away. And once the eagle fixes his eye upon its prey, it never moves its eye from its prey. It focuses completely on it and it flies directly to it until it is in its clutches. The eagle is a bird of focus. We as believers need to keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many things that will and can distract us, particularly in the environment in which we live today. If we are not careful, Satan can divert our attention and undermine our faith to where we are no longer the salt and the light that our God expects us to be. Even at rest, the eagle's fierce countenance gives notice that it is an adversary to be reckoned with. Just to look at an eagle will intimidate you. It definitely intimidates its prey. It was these qualities that prompted our founding fathers to choose the eagle as the symbol of our emerging nation. This past week, I saw an article on Facebook. Everything you see on Facebook is true, right? Right? <laughs> Listen, you, may, you, you need to learn how to be discerning between what is truth and what is garbage. And this article suggested that the choice of the American eagle as our national bird was actually copied after Nazi Germany's choice of the eagle on their flag. In, the seven, in, 17, in 1776, and shortly thereafter when they chose the eagle as the, Amer as the national bird, there was no such thing as Nazism. We need to learn our history. Do you understand that? There are two things today that Christians specifically need to be up on. Number one, the word of God. Your word is a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. We are to study it. We are to commit it to our hearts so that we might rightly divide it. But the second thing you need to learn is you need to learn history. Because there are a bunch of people out there who have an agenda to erase our history, to destroy our national heritage, and to develop us in the image of socialism. You need to know your history. Don't be ignorant. Someone said ignorance is bliss. No, ignorance is is just ignorance. Be up on what's going on. The eagle chooses its own course unafraid and not bound to the earth like the British lion. I just kind of threw that in because I thought that was cool. The American eagle has soared to altitudes never known by other nations. Regardless of those who try to minimize and erase our history, the eagle has the right, has was the right choice to represent our national identity. <laughs> I love the fact that we have as our national bird, the eagle. The eagle thrives in a storm. I love this. You know that most birds, when storm is approaching, you know what they do? They cower down. They hide in the trees or anywhere they can to get away from the storm. You know what the eagle does? He flies right into the storm. Because as he flies into the storm and those winds get beneath his wings, he soars even higher than he ever has. We're afraid of the storm. But we need to understand, and by the way, we're going through a national storm right now. And we need to recognize that this storm is our, our opportunity to shine as believers. It is our opportunity to show that we really are salt and light. And not to be discouraged and not to be distracted by a lot of this political rhetoric out there that is only out there to try to divide us and to develop hatred and bitterness within us. Let me tell you right now, hatred and bitterness is wrong. Do you know what the defining characteristic of Christianity is? Love your enemies. You know, you know what Islam says? Kill your enemies. Do you, do you know what Hinduism says? You don't have any enemies. Do you know what Christianity says? Love your enemies. And that's what we're supposed to do. Don't get, don't get all tied up in all of this political rhetoric, which 
two seconds into eternity won't mean a blessed thing. Eagles are choosy about their company. They only flock with other eagles. They don't hang with sparrows or pigeons, much less turkeys. You are identified by the company you keep. You hang with turkeys, you'll act like a turkey. You fly with eagles, you will be an eagle. Eagles don't eat dead things. They are not scavengers like the vultures or buzzards. They hunt and they kill and eat their fresh prey. Now, I don't know how to uh, uh, apply that to Christianity. I just thought it was an interesting fact. fact. The eagle is an extremely domestic bird. It mates for life. If it loses its mate, whether the male or the female, it never mates again. It would rather be solitary than to choose the wrong mate. The female eagle, by the way, is very picky. She tests her suitors before choosing the right one. Female humans can learn from this. You know why? Because this eagle knows that whoever she chooses, she is bound to him for the rest of her days. She wants to choose a real eagle, not some turkey masquerading as an eagle. So ladies, I would be very careful about that. The female eagle also displays strong maternal instincts. She may be the most caring and attentive mother in all the animal kingdom. Deuteronomy chapter 32, which we have just read, is known as the Song of Moses. It is perhaps his swan song. After leading the children of Israel for 40 years, Moses is now advanced in age. He is 120 years old. And he is just about to pass from the scene. These last few chapters in Deuteronomy, Moses is preparing to handle over the mantle of leadership to Joshua. But he wants to remind Israel of some things before he passes from the scene. That is what... Deuteronomy 32 is all about. Forty years, I've already mentioned that. Before Moses departs, the, past, departs and the torches pass, their ancient leader offers a new song. Singing is important. Did you know that? Singing is important. I've had people say, well, I don't sing during the worship service because I don't have a good voice. It is not the quality of your voice that is in question. It is the quality of your heart. In, in, in Revelation chapter 5, it says that they sang a new song unto the Lord. And that song was a song of redemption. And I will revisit that in just a few moments. This is a song of remembrance. It recalls God's call, care for Israel despite, despite their murmuring and rebellion. Israel was not an easy people to lead. It was like herding a bunch of cats. It just was a difficult job. And Moses held it down for 40 years under difficult circumstances. In chapter 32, verses 11 and 12, Moses uses a... Actually, that is not a metaphor. It is a simile. A metaphor would be like where Jesus says, I am the door. If it was a simile, Jesus would say, I am like a door. And here it does not say that God is an eagle, but it says that God is like an eagle. So it is actually a simile of the mother eagle to illustrate God's love and watch care over his people. As the eagle stirs up her nest, look at this, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led them and there was no strange God in them. Note the parallelism between the eagle and God described by the phrases, as the eagle, so the Lord. As the eagle, so the Lord. Four things I want to share with you. First of all, God's leading. As the eagle stirreth up her nest, the mother eagle builds her nest high on the mountain peaks. There she protects and cares for her young. She feeds them and keeps them warm. Woe to the intruder that would threaten her young because she would take, make short work of them. 
The little eagles grow and get fat and lazy. That right there is a description of American Christianity. We have grown fat and lazy. Do you know where Christianity thrives? It thrives in the middle of persecution. That's why in the first 200 years of church history, they turned, literally, they turned the world upside down. They were not acceptable. They were considered to be the enemies of the empire. But in that environment of persecution and of resistance, they leaned upon the Holy Spirit of God and they grew exponentially. Did you know that when China fell into communism in 1949, it was estimated that there was 10 million Christians in China. When China came out from behind its curtain 30 years later, it was estimated that there was 100 million Christians in China. Do you know what happened? They thrived during a time of opposition. It called out casual Christians. The ones who hung around, they understood that they were not their own, but they had been bought with a price. And that they were to glorify God in their body and in their spirit. Do you know what most... American Christianity is about it's kind of like a club we join it, it's an extracurricular activity but the fact of the matter is that your Christianity if you are blood bought born again your Christianity should be your life that's the way it is supposed to be but the eagle is not meant to be a docile land dweller even on the lofty mountain peaks God made it to soar. So when the time is right, you know what the mother eagle does? She breaks up the nest. She makes it extremely uncomfortable for her little ones. And she pushes them out. You say, that's awful. No. Mama eagle wants her little ones to be real eagles. Not just pretenders. Not just posers. She may begin by jostling the nest with her wings. But if the gentle approach doesn't work, she will turn it upside down. She is determined to teach her little ones how to be the best eagle they can be. Sometimes God stirs our nest. Sometimes he has to disrupt our comfort zone. I think this pandemic is the disruption of our comfort zone. Now here's the problem. We are so adaptable that we can get comfortable even in a pandemic. Do you know what was the danger in Israel in those 40 years in the wilderness? That they got comfortable there. Do you know that when Israel went down into Egypt and was there for 400 years, remember they followed Jacob down there in order to flee the famine. And by the time that Pharaoh arose that did not know Joseph, Israel was prospering. They would have never left Egypt had God not allowed them to go into slavery that they would call upon him for deliverer and he would send Moses down to tell Pharaoh, the strongest power in the world that day, you let my people go. God did not mean for Israel to be a foreigner in the land of Egypt. He meant for Israel to occupy the promised land that he had given them. They were not meant to be slaves in Egypt. Now, let me suggest something to you there. All the way back in Genesis chapter 12, God made a promise to Abraham. I'll give you all this land. In fact, if you will read the biblical account, he is very specific of the boundaries of that land. I will give you this land. I will make you a great people. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. And in you all of the nations of the earth be blessed, will be blessed. That's the promise of Messiah. I will bless them that bless you. I will give you this land. Do you know why Israel has survived? When they have lived in the middle of millions 
of Muslims that want to kill them. Because God gave them the land. Because it belongs to them. And heaven and earth may pass away, but God's promises will never go unfulfilled. God is blessing Israel, and we better stay on the train to bless Israel as well. We need to recognize that as a people, God did not arbitrarily bless us. God blessed the United States of America because we were founded upon Christian principles. And if we lose our moorings, I guarantee you the blessings will go with it and are beginning to go with it right now. There is one answer for America, and it is definitely not socialism. I'm choosing my words here. I don't want to, but I'm choosing my words here. It is definitely not socialism. The answer for America is a revival and a turning back to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to get us out of this tailspin. I meant to tell you here, I've got a parallelism here, right here. The church of, at Jerusalem, by the, time, by the time we find it in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen suffers as the first martyr of the church, it has grown to around 35,000 adult members. It would have been very easy to be comfortable with that large of a Christian community. But the problem was, is that God told them, that they were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So guess what happened? Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And Saul was consenting unto his death, the death of Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made great havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. Can you read those last three words with me? Preaching the word. That's about a C minus. Ready? Preaching the word. See, God had told them to do that. But they got kind of warm and fuzzy down in their little comfort zone at Jerusalem. So God brought persecution so they would get up and get out and get on with the job. That's just the way God is. Maybe you, have maybe you have ever felt or have you ever felt God stirring your nest. Maybe he's trying to tell us something about the direction of our lives and our church during this pandemic. He's not, he's not, he doesn't care about our finances. Do you understand that? He doesn't care about our finances. Do you remember what he said to the church at Laodicea? You say we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And don't you know that you are naked and blind and wretched and poor? Why? Because they had gotten lukewarm. You know what Lady C would say? Well, we're not so bad. No, but they weren't very good either. God wants us to be hot with the gospel. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Thank you. I just want to be sure you're still awake. He wants us to fulfill our potential for Him. He loves us enough that He does not want us to be just mediocre Christians. He wants us to soar. God uses different means to get His point across. Maybe it's health problems or financial reverses or frustration when we leave Him out of the loop. That means when we don't pray. You're not going to find success as a believer. You're not going to find success as a Christian if you're not involved in prayer. Opening and closing doors, and maybe this one, maybe by sending the pandemic. It would not be the first time that God has used extreme measures to stir up the nest. If any of you guys were in here that was in our Thursday night Bible study, when we were studying the book of Amos, you know what God did to get Israel's attention? He sent a pestilence of locusts and brought famine in the land so they would get their act together. Maybe, just maybe, this pandemic is our final warning to get our act together. The second thing, God watches over us. Look at this phrase. Hovers over her young. The eagle hovers over her young. The Hebrew word to hover means to, means to brood at. The eagle watches her young through concerned eyes. She has broken up the nest, but she will not leave her little ones to chance. They are never 
out of her vision. She follows them and marks their paths. She frets over them and protects them from a distance, allowing them to explore and grow. But she is always close enough to intercede. God never left Israel in the wilderness to fend for themselves. I think this is amazing that he traveled with them for 40 years as the pillar of the cloud in the day and the pillar of fire at night. God is no, not only protective of his children, he's very practical because the cloud provided them shade from the desert sun. And the pillar of the fire at night provided them warmth and light in the darkness of the desert. A Hebrew could go to the openness of his tent, the opening of his tent, anytime at night, and he could look out, and in the middle of the camp of the Hebrews, he could see that column of fire out there and be reminded, God is with you. God has not left you. God will never forsake you. He provided shade from the desert. Well, that's redundant. Never think that you are alone. Never believe that no one cares about you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Remember the environment of this. He is writing to believers who have been scattered because of persecution to their faith. And he says to them, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Psalm 91, 4. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall trust. That is a direct reference to the eagle. Under his wings you will trust. I love this old hymn. Under his wings I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, still I can trust him. I know he, is, he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow. How the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often the earth has no balm for my healing. There I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8, for your father knows what things you need. What's that last verse say? Say it with me. Before you ask him. Let's do this again. For your father knows what things you need. How? Before you ask him. Number three, God's protection spreads abroad her wings. This is what the eagle does. Spreads abroad her wings. What an image we have here. As the predator threatens the young eagle, the mother spreads her feathers to intimidate the intruder. Some of you are old enough to remember the movie um, Karate Kid. Karate Kid. Thank you. She was in the first service. She knew I said. <laughs> she doesn't run my, read my mind. We're not channeling or anything. The Karate Kid. Do you remember his final move? That ah, that's the eagle. I, I know they call it the crank. Shut up. Now. I know they call it the crane. Don't interrupt me when I'm on a roll, man. You're right, it was the crane. But that's a picture of the eagle. I don't think you want to mess with the little eagle. You know what that pose is? That, that's a warning. You take one more step. Some of you have seen this video on Facebook. This guy, it looks like it's in some kind of a park setting. And this mama bear has her three cubs with her. And um, uh, he's trying to get the attention of the baby bears, of the cubs. And he's like acting like he's got something in his hand. Well, the mama leads them around the side of the car. Well, this knucklehead runs over in front to encounter the bear again. And at that point, mama's had it up here. And she just lunges at him. Well, he was bright enough to get out of the way. But my thought is, if I was going to capture it, you can't fix stupid. You don't mess with a mama bear when she is with her young. Other times, she may run from you. But if she's protecting her young, you're going to get on her bad side in a hurry. Same thing with the eagle. He, he spreads her wings abroad 
Isaiah 43, 2. Love this verse. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. I don't know what the future holds for believers. I do know this, that they blame the opening of churches for the increases in viruses in, in many areas. It has to be the churches. It can't be those protesters out there running back and forth without masks on, can it? And by the way, you need to have your mask on right now. That's what we do in here. You understand? There's a reason we wear masks. Let me suggest to you why I wear masks. Of course, I'm not wearing it now, but there's a reason because I'm talking to you. And I think I'm socially distanced from my closest friend here, Rose. There's a reason we wear masks. It's not because I, I'm so hepped up on it that they're going to protect you. But I do know this. I know even in this congregation, some of you, some of you are concerned. Some of you wear masks because you are fearful of catching the virus. And I wear a mask out of respect for you. It's a small inconvenience for me to wear a mask. I see these people on Facebook. They are so upset. They're making me wear a mask. It's like they're wanting you to cut off your thumb. Give me a break. It doesn't mean anything. But it's something we're going to do in order to meet the standards that we can meet inside and show the world that Faith Family Fellowship is still here. Can I get an amen? In California, the far left liberal governor, I would tell you his name, but I get nauseated when I say it, decided it was dangerous to sing inside a church building. It's okay to protest. It's okay to loot. It's okay to riot. But God forbid you would sing inside a church. Well, here's my problem with it. Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His, say it, presence with singing. Say it again. His presence with singing. Singing is a part of our worship. Acts chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether is it right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge? Now, as unusual as our governor is, he has not overstepped that. And I appreciate that. But if he should do that, we need to remember this. That the authority of the state ends at the front door of the church. The government has no right to tell us what to believe or how to worship. Boy, that was weak. Are you sure about that? Amen. Huh? Are you sure they have no right to tell us what to believe? Because I guarantee you if they could, they would. They have already attempted to label preaching against sin as hate speech. Well, i got to be honest with you. I do hate sin. Why? Because I know it destroys life. But I don't hate the sinner. Do you? Jesus died for the sinner. And we need to make that obvious. Be careful you don't get bound up in all of this political rhetoric out there that is only meant to divide us. That is only meant to divide us racially and spiritually. I love that song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Can't remember the colors. Yellow. Red and yellow, black. Red and yellow, black and white. Actually, it's changed. Red, brown, and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. And let me tell you something. They are precious in God's sight. And they better be precious in our sight as well. When you threaten God's children, he takes it personally. And he will protect his children. Number four. He ta it takes them and bears them on her wings. She carries her young on her back and flies forward or upward to altitudes they have never experienced before. This is new for these little eagles. All they've ever done is sit in the nest and eat. And all of a sudden now mama's got them on her back and she is headed for the sun. She shakes them loose to go into free fall, hoping they will spread their wings and fly on their own. But they, listen to this. They are never beyond the tip of her wings. They are never in danger because mama's there. 
If they falter, Mama is there to catch them and bear them up again. Eventually, the eaglet gets the idea and starts flapping its wings and learns how to be an eagle on its own. What a wonderful picture that is of our Lord. Rest in the Lord and He will give you and commit your way to Him and He will give you the desires of your heart. If you will submit yourselves under the mighty hand of God, this is in James, He will lift you up. You're safe. You are safe. In the Father's hands. God may let us stumble. But he will never let us fall. He is our safety net. God has a destination for you and me. It is a height we have never known. He will bear us up to heaven. And deliver us safe in his arms. I've got two scriptures to end up here. Here is the first one. And I am certain that God. Who began the good work within you. Will continue his work. Until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. You are safe in the Father's hand until either Jesus returns or until you are absent from this body and present with the Lord. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Can you say amen to that? Because it's true. Isaiah 40 verse 31. You know I had to use this verse on eagles. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Do you know what I think we need as a church, as Christians? Do you know what I think American Christianity needs? I think it needs new strength. New strength. And if we trust in the Lord, you know what He promises us? New strength. That we will soar on wings like eagles. Bless the Lord, I pray. Will people today, if there's even one here today, Father, that has a doubt about their salvation, I pray, Lord, that they will come to us, that we will be able to share with them once again the gospel and settle that matter. And I believe that probably most of us knew, need this new strength that you have promised if we just wait upon you. May your will be done in our lives and on this earth as it is in heaven. Amen.